This is Studio 809. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Outdoors with Hiking Bob podcast. I'm your host, Hiking Bob Falcone, and you can find me on my website at hikingbob.com, which has links to my social media, the other podcasts I've done, my photography website. You can also support the podcast at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Hiking Bob and help pay the bills and support this podcast. And also on that link, or on that website, there's a link there where you can sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is free. And you can also send me an email if you have a suggestion for a topic or a guest you'd like to see on the podcast or just want to drop a comment or anything like that. You can also email me. All of that is at hikingbob.com. And today I have a favorite guest of mine, somebody I always enjoy talking to and provide us with valuable information and insight is Alicia Philly, the healthy hiker. Alicia, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, Bob. It's great to be here. It's always a pleasure to talk to you, and I love sharing information with your audience. Great. And Alicia, you've provided us so much valuable information in the past about how to be healthy hikers and save our knees. I know that's one of the big things in your newsletter uh, that comes out several times a week it, is how to protect your knees. And we've, we've, we've talked a lot about that in the past and just having the right gear and your information is, is great information. And today I reached out to you because I want to talk to you about feet and how to take care of feet. And I've had a lot as, as listeners to this podcast are probably like rolling their eyes going, oh, God, he's got to talk about feet again and his boots. But I brought you out here because feet's an issue. We're hikers. Everything we do is on our feet. We wear equipment that, you know, if we're backpacking, especially heavy packs, things that you know, everything is on our feet. So it's a good topic to talk about. So I figured we could talk about our feet. And I'll give you a brief overview of what's happened to me in the last year. But about a year okay. ago, I started experiencing foot pain, feet, just pain on the soles of my feet. It was just painful. It was like, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't definitely, it definitely wasn't plantar fasciitis, which I know was a big deal for a lot of people, but they were just sore. Um, so I went to eventually just, you know, try different insoles and that didn't work. I got newer boots that didn't fix it. Constantly sore, made my life miserable. I could only hike four or five miles and my feet would be sore. Went to the good feet store. They set me up with some nice, you know, with, with some arch support and stuff like that and made all the difference in the world. It was like night and day. It, It cost a lot of money, but it was worth it because it made my feet instantly better. I, I needed support. I wasn't getting it. I had never needed extra support before, but I'm getting older. Things change. We'll talk about what that's, you, you can tell us what that's about here in a second. All was fine with that. And then on one of my feet, my right foot, I started having this, I would twist my foot and there would be this tremendous pain on the outside of my foot. Almost you could pinpoint where it was and it would go up the, my calf. And I mean, it would hurt. It would just hurt like nobody's business. I mean, it was like the worst pain ever. And went to my doctor, sent me to an orthopedist. There was something called a perineal. And you yeah, can perineal. probably post. Mm-hmm. Per, yes. Um, uh, um, tendonitis, which is this tendon that runs down your calf, wraps around your foot right where it was hurting. Um, and that caused my ankle to weaken, which means then I had to get ankle support, which worked very well. Um, and, but my ankle, if I'm not wearing some kind of ankle support, that right ankle wants to twist a lot and that every step is just that ankle just wants to twist out. So long story short, had ankle support for that. Didn't need to wear the arch support so much anymore. Um, and short story, unfortunately too long is that I, um, have now found in the last month. Um, just by shopping around some really good boots. They come up a little higher um, and they really support my ankle where I don't even have to wear the ankle supports anymore that I was wearing. They really, and I've been hiking really well without them. I still have a little bit of foot pain. Um, I'm slowly extending my hikes. I really had to shorten up my hikes. It barely made my 800 mile goal last year. Um, and have had some issues, but I'm slowly extending them because I found these boots that just really wrap around my ankle really well and support it really well. So I finally 
you know, just just a pain. Uh, getting old is not for the for the uh, for the uh, uh, getting old is not for the weak. I guess I don't know. It's uh, it's hard. Um, so anyway, a lot of things happened to me in just the last year, and typically, foot pain was not an issue. Um, it was has never been an issue until it cropped up a year, pretty much just about a year ago when it just became a thing. So yeah. I hope you can shed some light on uh, as as I also had to go up a, a size in my boots because my yeah. feet, I don't know this, your feet right. spread out as you get older. Yeah. News to me, I was trying Definitely. to wear this. I even tried wearing the same boots I've been buying and all of a sudden they were real tight. I'm complaining to the company, what'd you do to the size? And they're going, we didn't do anything. I go to the store and they said, well, you're supposed to be wearing this size. I, go, I never wore that size. I wore this size. Your feet spread out. Yeah. What well, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not a doctor. And I'm certainly not a podiatrist. <laughs> I don't even play one on TV. You know, I was uh, an EMT for 40 years. You know how many foot things we saw? None. We were treating yeah. heart attacks and accidents. We didn't treat feet. So I don't know anything about that stuff. So anyway. Um, All right. Shed Let's some get into light it. on what was yeah. going on. <laughs> Absolutely, Bob. And why didn't you call me sooner? Goodness gracious. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kicking myself in the butt for not having said, Alicia, help me here, but you know yeah. I don't like to, I don't like to lean on people. I you know I should have done that. Absolutely, Bob, we're pals. You can call me anytime. Okay. But uh, and I, I have a lot of people reach out to me for just consultations. You know, sometimes because one of the one of the biggest questions I get is how do how do I what's the right thing to wear on my feet? Like, what's the right uh, shoe? Um, is it a boot? Is it a shoe? Is it, can I just wear my running shoes? You know? So, um, so let's just start with some, some basics about feet. Uh, number one, we don't think enough about our feet. You know, we are on them when we're hiking a lot, but we're not on them during most of the day. So that's the first thing is that a lot of times people just don't spend enough time on their feet and then they go for a hike and they wonder why their feet are so tired, why their feet are fatigued, or why they have pain, or why they get themselves injured. Well, it's often just because you haven't spent enough time on your feet. Those, just so many tiny little muscles within your feet. And if you don't train them, just like you train all the other muscles in your body, they're going to not be strong enough to do what you want them to do. So a lot of people can relate to this analogy. When you cook Thanksgiving dinner or some big holiday dinner and you are in the kitchen and by the end of the day, your feet are just so tired. I mean, your dogs are barking, um, but you haven't walked that far. I mean, most kitchens are just not that big. You didn't put in a lot of mileage, but you spent a lot of time standing on your feet. And most of us just aren't used to doing that. Now, if you're a, if you're a teacher, if you are a wait staff, if you work retail, if you're a day laborer, then you have the opportunity to do that. But for those of us that are stuck at a desk most of the time, um, we're just not standing enough. So a lot of times your feet will just start to get tired. Um, so that's the first thing is that if you're going to train for a hike, if you've got some ambitious goal or if you are, you know, it's springtime and all of a sudden you want to go out and do a 10 miler and you haven't done more than a neighborhood walk all winter, um, think about working up to that. Think about the amount of time you would need to be on your feet to walk 10 miles, to hike 10 miles, and then think about working up slowly, whether that could be at a standing desk, if you are a computer person, or um, elevating whatever work you do to where that you're having more time to just stand and get your feet used to being, having that weight bearing on them. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, how do you pick the right shoe? Well, there's lo you have lots of options. You have hiking boots, you have trail runners, you have hiking sandals, um, and then you have just a regular, you know, running shoe, just a regular athletic shoe. A regular athletic shoe isn't my favorite because they're designed to be very flexible. You are running on Typically, you're, they're designed for running and on hard surfaces. So if you were to take an athletic shoe, you could just, most of them are so light and flexible these days, you can pick them up with one hand and bend them in half. 
that's too much flexibility for hiking. It's not going to protect the bottom of your feet from roots, rocks, and uneven surfaces. And if you don't have enough protection on the bottom of your foot, you're actual, actually going to get bruising on the bottom of your feet, and that's going to hurt. So if you're somebody who's been out hiking and it's like, oh, my feet hurt, they're so tired, um, they just, the bottoms of them are so sore, it may be because the shoe that you're using for the kinds of hiking that you're doing aren't protective enough. Now, if you're if you're hiking in the sand, if you're out west, you're going to Joshua Tree, um, any uh, you're going to Great Sand Dunes, any of the places where you are hiking through something really soft and spongy like sand, that might be okay. It might get you through. Okay, so that's that's one shoe eliminated for the most part. Hiking sandal, some people love them, but I am not a fan. I would not recommend that for anyone because they just don't have enough protection for the entirety of your foot. They might have a nice rubber sole and protect the bottom of your foot, but they're not going to protect you from stubbing your toe, from a snake who happens to be on the trail, from poison ivy that has creeped onto the trail, poison oak, any of that kind of stuff. So I just don't think that there's enough overall protection for your entire foot in a hiking sandal. That said, some people just love them. So if you're, you know. if you're out here where I'm at now in Arizona, they're not going to protect you from the cactus. That too. Right. The cactus. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Any, I've anything. Had, it, go ahead. I, I've had cactus spines go right through the sides of my boots. Sure. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, um, you know, taking my boots out, digging out cactus. When I can't, I, I know there's people out here who wear the, the hiking sandals. Like, Oh, this is what we wear in the desert. I said, you're crazy. <laughs> I, I can't see how you do that. So. Absolutely. Plus you get um, things between your foot and the bottom of the shoe, you'll get little pebbles and that can rub a spot on your shoe, on your foot, on your skin, impact your skin. That's just not a good idea. It's not, not great. Trail runners. Those are going to give you more protection on the bottom. They're going to have a nice protection at the end of the shoe. So they'll have a extra, extra stability, support protection that sort of wraps around the toe which is going to really be helpful in protecting your toe, but they are still going to give you more flexibility than a hiking boot. They are low profile, so they're not going to support your ankle at all. But, um, you know, some people really find them comfortable and really do well in them. That That's, you know, that's a personal preference, something you just have to try out. A more traditional hiking boot is going to be the gold standard. It's You can get a low-rise hiking boot or you can get a high-rise. A low-rise goes below your ankle. A high-rise goes above your ankle. This is what I hike in. This is what I prefer. It just gives your feet the most stability and the most protection. I hike sometimes in a low-rise if it's not going to be very challenging, but if I'm in the Grand Canyon, I want a high-rise boot. I want as much protection as I can get. So it's... That comes down to personal preference, but a hiking boot is just going to give you the most overall protection underneath your foot, over the top of your foot, stability, and can even give you some um, waterproof protection. So protection against water coming in and getting your socks and everything wet. There's one more distinction that we need to make when we talk about shoes, and that is the heel rise. So typically you have a regular rise shoe, which if you look at a running shoe, there is a little bit of a heel lift in the back, right? We very rarely, unless we're barefoot, walk in a shoe that doesn't have any sort of heel lift in the back. That's just the way that they've shoes have been designed. It's what most of us are used to. There is a zero drop shoe, which is completely flat with no heel rise. Ultras are an example of a zero drop shoe. Some people love these zero drop shoes. Some people say that they are the um, solution to whatever their foot problem is or has been or worked for them, what have you. Here's what you need to know about zero drop shoes is that you can't go from a regular, a lifetime of walking in shoes that have a heel lift to a zero drop shoe and expect to just go out and, and hike 10 miles. Your body's not used to that. You don't have enough tendon length in the, in your Achilles and in your plantar fascia. So you have to work up to that. Any sort of a zero drop 
float barefoot uh, simulating type of shoe. You got to work up to it. So you want to ease into that. Do a little bit at a time. First, spend time in it walking around your house. Then maybe go for some short neighborhood walks. Then maybe extend by half a mile every week your distance until your body is really used to it. And you've accommodated and gotten some extra length in your tendons there. Now, Ultras have come out with a mid drop, I think they're calling it. Maybe they're calling it a low drop. I can't remember what they've decided to call it, but it's not a typical rise and it's not a complete flat shoe. There's it, they've come out with something that's sort of in the middle. So that it's going to be interesting to see who lands there and how many people like that. I haven't gotten enough feedback on that. So ultimately, if you ask me what's the right shoe to hike in, it's going to be whatever works for you. And I, I don't endorse any particular type of brand. There are brands that are, you know, their shoe design is more accommodating for certain types of feet. For instance, ultras that we just talked about that have that zero drop, they do have a wider toe box. So if you have a wider foot, especially at the front of your foot, that can work for a lot of people. Hoka's are another shoe that has a wider toe box. So a lot of times I will recommend Hoka's for people. Um, you know, there are just, there are some shoes that have a, a slimmer profile. Um, Solomon's have never really worked for me at all. They're just, I find them very narrow. So you have to actually get your feet in some boots and in some shoes and just see what is comfortable for you. I am not endorsing anyone in particular, but I do love that REI has such an amazing return policy. So that if you try something and it's and it doesn't work for you, you can you can return it and get something else. So that's one thing I really love about that particular retailer. Your local outfitter may have a similar policy. I think my Fleet Feet has a 30 day um, policy where you have 30 days to try out the shoe and see if it works for you. So make sure you're buying a shoe from a re retailer that has some sort of return policy for you and then spend the time within that time period figuring out if that shoe is going to work for your foot it's it's super important to do to do that to just spend time in the shoe and see how it feels on your foot i think one of the you pointed out a couple of good things like i like keens for mostly for casual wear because they keens have a very wide toolbox and a lot of people like that but they still they're not a wide shoe they fit good, you know, in the middle part of your foot, but the toe box is nice and wide. You get to wiggle your toes a little bit. And in the winter, that's kind of nice. If you're wearing heavier socks, you're not crunched up in there. Uh, I wore oboe shoes for a very long time, but they turned out when this foot problem happened. And I love their boots. They fit me well. I could put them on and go. Um, but when my foot had this issue and I need a little more space and it was hard finding them in a wide, they're all of a sudden not working. These latest boots I got now are Vasques which I never wore them very much, but they just happen to have this model that fit well. Um, and I think your point about retailers is very important. I've been buying them from REIA. I'm an odd size. It's hard finding anybody who even has them. And it drives me crazy when you buy boots from most retailers. And I'm going to start off by saying for my friends in Colorado Springs, buy local if you can, obviously. But I will say this, most of them have return policy that if they're used, you can't return them. So you're stuck to wearing them around your house. Okay, that's good to, you know, as you pointed out, you're starting with something new, but that's not real world for what we do. I don't know if they're gonna work till I'm out on a rocky surface, if I'm on a, an incline, if I'm on a side hill, if I'm out there using them in real life and the fact that a lot of retailers say, well, you've worn these outside, we can't take them back. Well, how do I know if they're gonna work? unless I use them in my real world. Um, you know, if I'm wearing dress shoes and I'm wearing them at an event, I can wear those around my house all week and figure out if they're going to work. That's fine. But if I'm wearing sure. buying hiking boots, I need to try them out hiking. And you telling me, and you being a realtor, telling me, well, you can't wear them outside. But that doesn't do <laughs> me any good. So I end up at REI a lot because, A, they have my size. And, B, I have a year – and I'll know within a couple of weeks if these boots are not going to work. And I'll wear them outside. I'll wear them hiking. And I brought them back. 
I'm not one of those people who wears the crap out of a pair of boots. They're all worn out and torn sure. up and then go back and yeah. say, these boots, I've worn the boots. Obviously, I've worn them. Um, but it's one reason why I like REI for that kind of stuff because they give you that flexibility to really try them out. You make some really good points there. I've never been a fan of trail runners or low boots because I need that ankle support. And in my career, it was always we wore boots um, on the job. So I am used to wearing a higher boot. Uh, I was in the military, wore combat boots. In the fire service, around the station, we wore higher boots. Of course, in the fire, we wore high boots. I'm used to wearing high boots. If I wear like a, a sneaker, which I rarely ever do, I feel weird. <laughs> I kind of do with that. <laughs> so I'm used to wearing over. I know people who like the trail runners, um, and but they give me, and with the issue I'm having now, obviously it would not work well for me. I, I've usually told people the same thing. Find a brand, a brand that you like. Um, I like Solomon's because they have this way of wrapping around your feet and kind of cradling your feet in there. I like Solomon's, um, you know, but there's other brands that have just never worked for me. It just, it doesn't mean they're not good. It just means they don't work for me. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. There's lots of great brands out there that I I wouldn't, you know, if someone were to ask me what's the best brand and I would say it's the one that gives you a shoe that really works for you. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't matter the brand. It just really matters the design of the shoe, but, but to transition to a adjacent topic here, one of the questions is, okay, well, you go through this big process, you find the right shoe that works for you. How long can you wear that shoe? How often does it need to be replaced? So there's no real good answer. We don't have a whole lot of data about that like we do with running shoes. But here's what you need to really know and pay attention to. Your hiking shoe is not going to break down on the bottom and show wear like your running shoe or your street shoe or your sandals or dress shoes are going to. That bottom is so uh, tough. It's designed to be so tough. You're, you're not going to be able to see like, oh, my tread's almost gone. That tread's going to last forever. What does start to break down, however, with the sweat, with the heat, is the support inside the shoe and the glue binding the shoe. So before your bottom wears out, you're going to have a blowout up top. And you see hikers all the time, you know, they're like, be sure you bring your duct tape in your day pack because hikers have blowouts and they have to end up duct taping their shoe together. And the reason that happens is because they've waited too long to replace it. So is there a standard of when you should replace it? Well, that's where every brand is going to be a little bit different. And that may be a reflection of price point. We don't have that data. That's just a, a guess based on the adage you get what you pay for. But I don't know that that's true. Um, but you need to be aware that if you're hiking in hot environments, like if you're an Arizona hiker, then your shoe is going to break down faster because of the heat, because it's going to really affect the glue and all of the padding as much sweating as your feet are going to do in that environment. So you will need to replace your shoe more often. Somebody like you who's hitting 800 miles a year, I I don't think you should be hiking in the same shoe all year long. Like I think that's too much for one shoe. So here's a couple of strategies that you can use. One of the things we do with runners is we suggest that they have perhaps two pair of shoes. They may be the same shoe. They may not. And you either alternate them on days of wear because you need to give that padding on the inside time to fully dry out and re inflate (laughs) that's a word because when you're wearing a shoe it packs down that padding and then when you get when you're out of the shoe that padding will sort of re-expand so as it dries out it'll re-expand a little bit and then it will offer you better support the next time but if it doesn't have a chance to dry out in between it's going to break down even faster so one of the things that runners will do will they'll they'll have it they'll either alternate days with their shoes or they will have a shoe for short runs and a shoe for long runs and i would suggest that with my my hikers too that you if you're just doing neighborhood walks or short training hikes most of the week you wear one particular shoe and then you have your shoe that you wear for your longer hikes um your eight ten twelve milers 
that 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 shoe is just for the long hike so that you it the, then the mileage and wear will sort of average out between the two shoes and also you're giving the shoe plenty of time to rest and dry out in between wear so that's that's one thing that's really important to remember i think hikers wear their shoes longer than they should i have this issue with clients all the time they'll come to me they're like yeah everything's been going fine but boy my feet are starting to hurt it's like well when how old is that shoe well, it's a couple of years old it's only a couple of years old i hear that that's <laughs> oh, only two or three years old <laughs> you know it still looks great yeah it still looks great on the outside but it's the inside that's the problem so immediately if you start having an issue if it's with your hip if it's with your knee if it's with your feet my first thing is always get new shoes. It's, you know, it, it, unless you just have in the last two months gotten new shoes, in which case the new shoes may be also the issue. But that's always my first go to. It's like, okay, get new shoes and then let's see, see where you are because those shoes, the way they wear on the inside where you can't see can really impact. And I, I, I'm curious, how old were the shoes you were hiking in when you started having foot pain? They were not old. And I will tell you that like the three pairs of boots that I have here, the two brand new pair that I just bought in the last month will not make it to the end of the year. Um, they're, they're just not going to make it. And I do find that with the surfaces I hike on either here in the desert or at home in Colorado in the mountains and in the rock and in the Pikes Peak region where I spend most of my time, and you're familiar with that, you and I have hiked out there, we have that very sharp Pikes Peak granite. Um, I will tell you that the soles do wear out pretty quickly on, on my boots there. Um, it tears up boots. So um, the pair of the boots I'm wearing right now are not going to make it to the end of the year. They'll pro I'll probably be lucky if they make it to the end of summer because they're going to wear out. And I, and I actually, you know, I have a database. I record every hike I go on. I have a spreadsheet, I should say, not a database. I have a spreadsheet, what day it was, how many miles was it. It totals up the mileage. How many feet of ascent did I do, totals that up. And in the comment section, I actually, you know, where, the, you know, I, where I fill in like the park or the trail and blah, 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 whether my dog was with me or not. Um, I actually put in there which boots I was wearing. And I can then go back and look at it. And I have found that I am lucky to get three or 400 miles out of a pair of boots. And in comments I've read on websites, retail sites, where somebody will write in like, how many miles can I expect to get? I am finding now that retailers are saying, you're going to get maybe three or 400 miles out of a pair of boots, which to me I is like- I think that's generous. I think that's generous. I think that's over generous. And for me, it's like, how much did I pay for these boots? And I'm going to get three or 400 miles out of them. Then I read somebody says, I wore the same boots for five years. I'd love to see what your posture looks like because that cannot <laughs> be good for you. Um, but I am finding out that I am wearing out the soles of my boots really quickly because of the surfaces we're on. Now, if I'm in, if I'm on the East Coast where it's not a rocky soil, it's a very soft stuff, I can probably get more mileage out of them. Or at least it, if I don't get more mileage, it's not going to be because the soles wear out. It's going to be because all the other stuff you point out, the uppers wear out, the pads wear out, all this other stuff happens. Um, but yeah, I am finding if I can squeeze out 300 miles on a pair of boots, which to me just, I paid a lot of money for these boots. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I'm lucky sure. if I get that many miles out. So the, pair, the boots I'm wearing right now yeah. that I love are not going to make it till probably past the end of summer at the most. Right. And if you, even if you think, I think 300 miles is probably, uh, I, I would say that would be max. And a couple of things is number one, if you, if you are averaging, you know, a lot of people are doing the 52 hike challenge and let's just say half of those are 10 milers. So that's 50 miles. And then the other half add up to at least 50 miles, you know, then that's, that's a, at, you know, minimum a hundred miles a year, minimum. And then two years, then you add in time, um, you know, the half-life of the material that they're made from deteriorates over time without any input at all. So then you add that on and then you add elemental issues on like heat and sweat and wetness. And did you walk through the stream with them? How many times did you do that? Like, I think two years is probably 
you know, max for, for just your average hiker to get out of a boot. The other thing that I'm finding too, because I'm also a runner, the lighter they make these shoes, the less um, durable I'm finding the materials are. And so I'm finding where I could in the past buy a new running shoe, you know, make it last a year. Maybe I have two pairs that I can run all year in. Mm -mm. I'm getting four to six months out of it, like literally four months out of a running shoe sometimes, depending on how much mileage I'm putting in. Wow. So I think, I think it's because these, they're going for lighter. They're, they're really trying to make things more light, more breathable. Um, but I think the sacrifice we're making is less durability. So if somebody used to wear a shoe that could, a boot that could last them five years or so, maybe because the materials they were built with are different, you know, just like your toaster. <laughs> My parents have a toaster that they got when they were ma- when they got married in 1966 that still works perfectly. And I've been through like seven toasters since I got married and whenever that was to 1996, 98. <laughs> I'll, I'll bet when your parents turn on their toaster, the lights probably dim in the house. You know, it probably uses so much power. <laughs> um, you know, I was thinking of something you're talking about as we're as you were talking there. You know, we're talking about hiking boots. Um, there are backpacking boots, uh, which are more durable. Um, but I don't find them, and I'm not a backpacker. I don't do a lot of that stuff. Um, but I find that if you're hiking, backpacking boots um, are a little overkill. Um, what do you What do you think about that? They're they're too stiff. There's too. They're made for you carrying a big pack all the time. And if you're hiking and you're wearing a small pack, you know, a day pack with your day stuff in there, you know, uh, rain gear, first day kit, the set, you know, the 10 essentials, that kind yeah. of stuff. Um, that backpacking, which besides the fact that they're way expensive, um, seem to be a little overkill for hiking. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think most backpackers would tell you they're overkill for backpacking too, because, okay. you know, if you're a, if you're a through hiker, um, or, so we're talking, you know, major backpacking, like weeks at a time you are wanting to be as light on your feet as possible. And those boots are so darn heavy that most of the uh, through hikers are going to go for footwear that is as light as possible. A lot of them really do like trail runners. So they will end up a lot of times because their feet will change on the hike. They will stop at outfitters and actually change purchase different kinds of shoes or if they've got one that they love and they know is reliable for them, then they will just have that drop shipped to them two or three times along the trail. Like it's not unusual for them to go through two to three pair of shoes, like on the AT, um, you know, at a time. So I think most everybody thinks backpacking boots are over. You know, it's just, they're just so darn heavy and so darn stiff. I don't, there may be environments where that is particularly useful and needed. I can't think of any really here in the States, but that, you know, there may be a use for that. I'm seeing somewhere in between, like it's not a day hike, but it's not a thousand mile through hike, but you're going to be hiking maybe a 60 or 70 mile over the course of several days type of thing where you're carrying everything with you that that's where that kind of boot would maybe work. But it seems like it's a pretty narrow or pretty specific, time when you'd want to use that yeah and i just don't think anybody's carrying packs that are that heavy anymore like you know when i think of a backpacking boot like you're describing i'm thinking of a, a metal frame yeah exterior a, frame pack yeah. like the old days you know and i just think that uh we're all just trying to get as light as we can so it's, right. it's probably not a whole not a big market for that I do want to touch on, though, the boot aspect. So there's a lot of controversy I see in Facebook group chats about the benefits, the pros, and the cons of ankle support. And so there is this thought that uh, if you have too much ankle support, your ankles will be weak. And then there is this thought that your ankles can't handle it, and so they need this ankle support to be stable. 
And the truth is always like somewhere in the middle, right? Uh, neither of those things is is a hundred percent true. What an ankle support will do or a boot will do, it's not going to keep you from spraining your ankle. It's not going to keep you from falling. What it does do is it gives you a lot more proprioceptive input on your skin and sort of an exterior skeleton for you to feel so that when you start to lose your balance or veer off, your body has more input to correct that movement as opposed to just relying on your ligaments. So if your ligaments are stretched out for whatever reason, either you've had ankle sprains in the past, or you're just somebody who's a little bit loosey goosey in their joints and has a little bit laxity in your ligaments, then that ankle, extra ankle support, that extra input around your ankle is going to just feel good, number one. And then it's also going to let you know, like when you're when your ankle starts to touch the outside of the boot, that's going to give you an alert sooner than allowing your ligament to stretch all the way before it starts to give you input. So there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. Neither high top or low top is the correct answer. It's really just what your body needs, what works for you, what feels good for you, because confidence plays into your stability and safety a great deal when you're hiking. So if you just feel more confident and you feel more stable in a higher boot, then go with that because that's going to be the most important. It's just how, how do you feel when you're, when you're hiking? So wanted to just put that little debate to rest too. Cool. Um, I had not heard that debate, but um, to me that, uh, I don't know that it makes sense. I know that um, for me, when I, before I got these boots or the ankle support I had, they were, my ankle was twisting constantly and it was like that tendonitis was in there and it loosened every weakened everything and the only thing that was going to make it better was to get that support back in there um and mm -hmm. it was either that it was a, a wrap you know goes over the top of my foot then wraps around the ankle so it really tightened everything up but it was uncomfortable wearing it a little because i had to wedge that into a boot and uh, anyway um great information on footwear um which is vitally yeah. important and there are you know, there's debates all the time. You know, you get together with a bunch of hikers. What are you wearing? What are you wearing? Oh, these are the best ever. Well, it's great for you, but maybe not for me. That's okay. Everybody has their, okay. their preferences. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about the how to read the pain you might be having in your feed. Okay. You know, what, okay, what, what, are the different, what are the different things people feel and what does it all mean? Yeah. First thing that people feel typically is on their skin. So we've talked about the shoe, but now we need to talk about your foot in the shoe. So typically the biggest problems that hikers experience with their feet are blisters. And a blister is no small thing. A blister can absolutely sideline you. You can have everything you need for a through hike and you get a blister two weeks in and you can be done for like that can really just take you off the trail. Something that seems so insignificant. So skin care on your feet is paramount. It's absolutely 100% essential. One of the things that you should do is invest in a really good sock. Now that can be, again, that also can be different for different people. <laughs> there are several types of socks. You want to make sure you're avoiding cotton, right? I think probably anyone listening to this podcast, but in case somebody just stumbles in here uh, off of the Manhattan sidewalk and starts listening to hiking Bob, I want to make sure that they're not hiking in cotton socks. So avoid cotton at all costs. That's the most terrible thing you could do for your feet. You want to have either a wool or some sort of breathable synthetic. For your feet so that your skin on your feet can stay as dry as possible. Some people find that that wool or even some of the synthetics are, it, it becomes too abrasive. So I have this problem. I have a client who recently had this problem. She came to me and she said, um, so I've been hiking a lot more at springtime. She lives right near the AT. So she's been doing eight to 10 milers every week. 
And she said, I'm just getting this irritation on the bottom of my feet. It's just, it, you know, they just hurt. And I just feel this burn and I don't exactly have a blister, but it's, but it burns. And then I end up sort of hobbling. So I immediately knew what it was because I suffer from this too. And I asked her what she was hiking in and she was hiking in some wool socks. You can get just some irritation on your skin and it really can be debilitating. So what I recommended for her is number one, lube. Uh, Body Glide is my favorite to use. Some people like Vaseline on their feet. I don't particularly like it. It doesn't breathe. It doesn't break down. It's, you know, petroleum based, but uh, you do you if that's something that has you found that's worked for you. But I like Body Glide or any sort of, um, there's, I think Monkey Butt is another one, just like any sort of sports lubricant that prevents chafing. And I would, I Body Glide all the areas where I know I typically can get a hot spot on my feet. Then the second thing is to have, if you want to use those wool shoe, wool socks, but they are too abrasive on your skin. Um, and I'm especially talking to my ladies who like to get pedicures, right? Because you have, or even my guys, um, because you just don't get that natural callus on the bottom of your feet and your skin on your feet doesn't toughen up. So there's nothing wrong with the sock and there's nothing wrong with you. It's just a function of, we like to have soft, supple feet. Most of us don't go around barefoot anymore um, and build up that sort of toughness on the bottom of your feet. So yes, that tender skin can get irritated if you have just a rough cloth, like a wool or a, a darn tough sock might be. So your options there are to use a liner. So you have a, a very thin liner on your foot that then rubs against the material of that particular sock. Or you go with a double line sock like a right sock. A right sock has um, the liner built in. So it's basically a sock inside of a sock, that brand is. And those two surfaces glide against each other and it limits the abrasion on your feet. Um, she tried this and did beautifully. She, she didn't have any problem whatsoever. I will tell you, um, I advise people to get a tiny little travel size of body glide and keep that in your day pack as one of your essentials because you don't know when you're going to have to take all your shoes off to cross a stream or something like that. So even having an extra pair of socks in your day bag is not, is really not a bad idea if you're going to be going through some water. Um, here, our local our local through hike, the Lone Star Trail, has got areas that are really swampy. And just depending on time of year and how much rainfall we've gotten, you could be, you know, up to your ankles in sort of icky, muddy swampiness. So, you know, it, it's a great idea to have an extra pair of dry socks with you. So foot care, uh, particularly spending time thinking about the skin on your foot is the is the number one most important thing because that's the number one thing that people will complain about when you're talking about foot pain with hiking. I'm I'm glad you mentioned socks because I I'm a fan of both smart wool and darn tough and all my socks are going to be one or the other um, and I find them to be and wool socks to be the best for me um, and what I like is smart wool makes them in different um, weights so there's a little thicker sock for the winter and a lighter sock for the summer. Uh, you know, and we know about the, obviously the moisture wicking, which keeps your feet dry. Um, I have been fortunate that I rarely ever, I can count on one hand over years, how many times I've had a blister on my foot. That's never been an issue for me. I know some people who get blisters a lot and, and I can say from when I've had them, it is debilitating. You are down for the count until that heals. Uh, you didn't think anything could hurt so bad as a blister, but oh my, they, they, they do hurt. Uh, but I've been fortunate of that. So I don't know if it's because I'm just, I've got the right shoe and the right boot and, you know, or the right sock and everything. It, there's not all this stuff rubbing or, you know, creating a blister. Um, but yeah, I've been a fan of darn tough and smart. Well, I've even had darn tough. Actually, they actually do stand by their stuff. They guarantee them forever. I had one get a hole in it. I, I emailed them and they sent me a new pair of socks. So like, We'll take care of it for you. Yes. So like, I kind of like that. They're not cheap, but, yeah. um, but they do back them up. They're so, great. Yeah. They're great socks. Both of those brands are terrific socks. I just have to wear a liner if I'm going to wear one of those be just because of that irritation that I get just on my skin. It's not a blister per se, but it's just, 
you know, it just gets irritated because, uh, yeah, I do. I, I wear sandals in the summertime. I live in Texas. I get pedicures and my skin is just kind of, uh, not, not tough. Oh, uh, you're just too <laughs> soft. Bottom, That's right? what it is. <laughs> oh, no, I'm an old coffee. <laughs> cool okay so so we covered kind of one thing there so um if you're experiencing like like to just sore feet like i started out with just the bottom of my feet were just sore and for me it turned out that as i'm getting older um you know the the feet spread out you kind of lose some support um and and it took me a while to figure out what's going on but if you start getting that, you start the bottom of your feet starts to get sore, or you get this new soreness. Something is weird with your feet. We kind of talked about maybe just new pair of boots, but what should people be looking at? What should they be saying? I need. I ended up in physical therapy because of the tendonitis I had and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. But I. I'm thinking to myself, what could I have done to avoid that expense and and time of going to physical therapy? If you start getting this foot pain, you know. What are different kinds of pain and what should people look at if they start experiencing something like that? Yeah. Well, first of all, don't ignore it. If you start to feel something unusual, don't ignore it. Because as you know, uh, it can take a long time to heal if you let it go. And it can really be troublesome and really affect your long-term goals for hiking. So first thing I always do is just look at, evaluate your shoes. Are they too old? Are they very new? If they're too old, is it time to replace them? Or if they're very new, have you not given them enough time to break them in? So maybe cut back on your mileage, wear them around the house, just let your feet start to get used to them. Think about, are you? did you do too much? Did you exceed the load capacity for your feet? So again, as I talked about in the beginning, if you're not used to being on your feet and then you, springtime now, and now you've done two 10 milers within seven to 10 days, and your feet are really uncomfortable, it could be you just you just did too much too soon, right? You got to work up to it a little bit. Um, one of the most common things that um, hikers do complain about, well, let me let me go back and say, address the issue with your feet changing size. Your feet are going to change as you age. You're going to lose your the volume in your arch. Your arch is going to start to collapse. And that is a function of, Time on your feet, if you have gained weight, this can also happen. So people say, well, my feet have spread. Or if you're pregnant, this can happen. It's really because what happens is your your arch, the volume inside the arch, it decreases. The arch falls a bit, and that therefore makes the feet a little flatter, and they are a little bit wider. They may also be a little bit longer. So constantly evaluate that too, you know, and just don't be frustrated if the shoe that you used to work for you doesn't anymore. Like that's just a normal part of aging. It's just something that we are all going to have to deal with. Um, the other thing you want to look at too is, are you hiking in a hot environment or do you, are you just somebody who has a lot of swelling in your feet when you're on them so that your foot volume increases inside the shoe and that makes it uncomfortable. If that's the case, then you may need to go. I've worked with hikers who had to go with a bigger size shoe <clears throat> and like two layers of socks to start out the hike. And then midway through or after a few miles, then they take a layer of sock off and now they're fitting comfortably in that shoe. So you have to really think about your feet and how they change throughout your lifespan as well as how they're going to change throughout a hike. Um, but the, the next thing that hikers most often complain about is plantar fasciitis. And some of that has to do with um, doing too much too soon, right? You just overload the capacity for what you've asked your feet to do. And it can be not supportive enough footwear as well. And you just, and you set up an inflammatory process there with your Achilles tendon where it attaches on the bone and then that tough layer of fascia on the bottom of your feet. So tell us what are the, the symptoms of plantar fasciitis? Cause I've had people say, is that what's bothering you? And I'm like, I'm not even sure what the symptoms are. And when I had pain on the bottom of my foot, that was a question. Turn off. That wasn't it. But what are the symptoms of that? Yeah. 
The biggest symptom of plantar fasciitis is pain first thing in the morning. When you get out of bed and you take those first couple of steps in the morning and it's just like, oh gosh, that really, really hurts. But then it gets better as you are walking around a little bit. It tends to like warm up and ease up. That's a, that's a number one signal that it could be plantar fasciitis. There's oftentimes also pinpoint tenderness right under the heel. So sometimes there's a bone spur in conjunction with plantar fasciitis that plays a role in that as well. So in that pain can also extend up into the arch. And that is a, that's a tough one to treat. There's not any particular gold standard do this protocol and it's going to be better. Everybody is really different in treating that, but it's one that you don't let go. You don't, uh, just keep doing what you're doing and think it's going to get better. You really have to to rest and take take the load off of that and seek some sort of treatment intervention, go to physical therapy, um, you know, any of those. Go see your doctor about it because it it can definitely get worse on you know before it gets better. <laughs> well, I'm glad I haven't had that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, yeah it's not fun anyone anyone that's had it will tell you it's not it's not a good time <laughs> I, I've, I've seen people when you mention they roll their eyes go yeah it was miserable so uh i'm glad yeah. that uh, i haven't had that and i feel bad for anybody who has had it what are the kinds of common pain that you know i had this uh let's talk about this tendonitis i had because i guess it's not uncommon yeah. and it was painful and i'm like wow why does this hurt so much and then i when i would do some research on it, like look at the Mayo Clinic website, some other stuff. They they describe it as the patient will ha- will complain of excruciating pain. And mm-hmm. holy cow, I can tell you that is a spot on description. Mm-hmm. I have never had anything hurt so bad. Um, yeah. And when you're halfway out on a hike and you've got that pain, you're hobbling the rest of the way back. And every step is killing you. I, I cannot tell you how miserable that was, but let's talk about that tendonitis because it comes down your leg, it rolls mm-hmm. around underneath the outside of your foot, goes across your arch. Yeah, so, so the peroneal muscle attaches to the outside of your uh, leg. So it's, on, it's not on the inside, it's on the outside of your leg and it runs down right behind your ankle bone. And it, it then, there's two parts of it. This muscle has two parts. One of them then attaches right there at, at the side of your foot and the other part runs through this little groove then underneath your foot. So it's often misdiagnosed. And if you have had an ankle sprain, sometimes you can really injure that muscle and it's, and it's missed. Like people, you know, doctors typically just, it's a tiny little muscle and they just typically don't think about it because there's other much larger things at play when you sprain your ankle. They're wanting to make sure your ligaments are intact and um, that you haven't had a little avulsion fracture or any, you know, affected the bone in any way. And so a lot of times this, this muscle gets overlooked, but um, it is a very difficult one to treat. (laughs) The action of this muscle has to do with everting and inverting your foot. So turning it uh, from one side to the other and it doesn't it's not an action that we really do thinking about all the time but it's an important component of the walking movement of your feet when you walk so yes you are going to feel it it's not insignificant a lot of times um, if you are a a pronator um, it's not always an issue but you can stretch that muscle if your arch falls and you don't have that arch support then you can strain that muscle but if you are a supinator and you roll out on the outside of your foot then you also can stretch that that tendon and I'm guessing that when you started playing with your arch support and the alignment of your foot you changed up your walking dynamic and that muscle got strained is what is what I'm guessing happened. Um, but then that's a really difficult one to treat. So when, what, how do you know it's that particular muscle? If you go down and you look at your outside ankle bone and you feel along the outside of your foot, just below your little toe 
must move uh, bones that will move there's a little notch you can if you're you know kind of lean you can even you can feel that little notch if that pain is right there around that little notch typically then that is the peroneal muscle and that's what's what's bothering you um treatment options aren't great i mean <laughs> rest is the primary one uh, then you're going to want to do some exercises to strengthen your feet and you could possibly be a candidate for a cortisone injection. It's really important that if it continues that you get an MRI, because I have had clients who have had that, that particular muscle just shredded and they had a, they had previous ankle problems, pe previous ankle fractures or severe sprains and that all resolved and was healed and treated. And then they've had this long-term issue with this nagging pain and the doctor says well you know we treated all of that but then some, when they go in and do an MRI what they find out is that that muscle is actually torn and is impacting especially as they've gotten older starts to impact their their way they walk and um, give them a lot of pain and a lot of trouble so if it persists then ask, I would recommend that you ask your physician um, about the benefit of perhaps an MRI it's not something that you're going to pick up on x-ray. My, uh, my doctor, when I went to him with it, referred me to an orthopedist that they had in the practice. And I was fortunate, you know, trying to see an orthopedist is like, well, we'll see you in three months or something. But I actually got to see him the following week. And he diagnosed it pretty quickly. And he did do the cortisone injection that day, which did help. But mm -hmm. he also said, you're going to need some physical therapy to, to, mm -hmm. um, to strengthen that, which, which helped quite a bit. And one of the things that happened, one, I was out on a hike and I had that happen, twisted the ankle and you twist it and bam, that fires. And I'm like, I, I'm way up on this mountain, you know, and I can't hobble my way down. So carry a first aid kit, you know, I'm a good loyal EMT and I'm carry a first aid kit. And I found that I was able to take my shoe off, take my sock off and wrap tape around the bottom of my foot through the arch and that kind of pulled everything back together and, and strengthened it enough that I was able to get back down uh, with less pain. But obviously it was, and that got me included. In, okay, maybe there's a wrap I can get, did a little more research, found the wrap, that actually helped a lot. But it was a process trying to figure out what this was. But I will tell people, you'll know if you do this because it is the one of the worst things I've ever felt in my life. Yeah. I, and I've had patients who didn't, who didn't know what it is and had been to see doctors and, um, and had, you know, not gotten any kind of diagnosis. So you were fortunate that you went to somebody who, who knew feet and who, who knew the dynamics of what could be going on, but it is not typical. I mean, it's not atypical for you. If you are someone who has had an ankle sprain in the past that this ligament could have been impacted and can bother you down the road like not not right at the beginning but it can bother you down the road so um important thing i know you talked a lot about bracing and arch support and all of those things but exercise and strengthening your feet and strengthening your arch is really really important so if we want to talk for a minute about prevention um for a lot of these foot maladies and one of them is is exercise so there's some really simple exercises that you can do. You can um, write the alphabet with your feet in the air, especially if you're somebody who's sitting a lot. Nobody knows you're doing it. You just look like you're moving your feet, foot around. And that's a great way to work all those little intrinsic muscles in your feet and keep, keep them busy. Also, if you're someone who sits at your desk, this is going to be great for avoiding any sort of um, swelling in your feet and legs, sometimes pe people with desk jobs can get that. But if you're just moving those feet around all the time, you're going to activate your calf muscles as well and just get some pumping action and, and pump some blood out of there and fluid and keep things circulating. Um, another one is to take a towel, a, a, like a simple hand towel on the ground in bare feet and then use your toes to scrunch that towel up. Like keep just keep scrunching until you bring the whole towel back towards you um another easy one is a golf ball exercise so you can take a golf ball and try to pick it up with your toes and then put it in drop it into a cup 
Um, that's another great exercise that you can do. And of course, calf raises and stretching, calf stretches, those are important too, because that Achilles tendon affects your affects your feet. Calf strength affects how well supported your ankles are. Um, and then you can always get a resistance band and especially one of the small ones and put them around both feet and, you know, spread your legs apart and sitting like sitting on the floor or sitting in long sitting until there's some tension there. And then you just move your feet out to the sides, you know, both sides, you can uh, hold it and move your feet towards the inside. You can pedal up and down. I mean, I love, love resistance bands for foot exercises. So all of these passive things are good to help support your feet, but exercise and strengthening all those muscles is really what, you, you know, what needs to be done so that you can prevent and probably treat some of these issues that you might be having. And I think, you know, all that is great stuff. And a lot of that is the same treatment that I got from the physical therapist, but these different things to strengthen it. And that, that was his key thing was he just needs to strengthen all these things. I think a lot of us, and I fall into this thing, are sitting there thinking, I'm on my feet all the time. I hike all the time. Shouldn't all these things be as strong as they should be? Because I'm using them all the time. Because we think mm -hmm. use equals strength, but that's not necessarily the case is what you're telling us. You still need to even though you're using them and you would think that that's the strength they need, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. This goes back to probably our first podcast, you know, and it's <laughs> like, I hike 10 miles. I'd hike 800 miles a year. How can I be weak? Well, there are muscles that can be weak. There are, you know, the body doesn't care how you get something done, right? It doesn't care that it looks great or graceful. It just knows that your brain says go from point A to point B and it doesn't really care how it gets there. So this is wonderful because if we have an injury, if we have a stroke, if we, you know, have some sort of illness, we can still learn to get ourselves around. We can still learn to move because there's all this redundancy built into the body. But if something, you know, if somebody's not doing their primary job, I mean, you've sure seen this in an organization or what, like, you know, you're on the, you're on the fire truck and yeah, there's a guy who can drive, but if that's not his primary job, if he's really the tanker guy, then, you know, he's, he's not the best guy to be doing the driving. He could get you there, but he, you know, you want, you want the guy, right? <laughs> the body is the same way. You want the primary mover to be doing its job. And there are secondary movers that can come in and pitch in and do the job, but they're going to get tired. They're going to get strained. Something isn't going to wear right. It's going to cause stress. And this is why we end up having foot issues, knee issues, hip issues. It's because the primary movers aren't strong enough, don't have the kind of endurance they need to do the job that you want them to do. And that's too why... You can do a five mile hike and be like, great, I'm wonderful. And then you do a nine mile hike and you're like, holy cow, what happened? Well, the primary mover didn't have that endurance built in yet. So when you exceed that capacity for your primary mover and your secondary movers have to pitch in, something's going to be off kilter somewhere. Got it. Well, cool. Well, Alicia, we've, we, I've kept you way longer than I promised I would. Um, as always, and we didn't even get to half the stuff we had on our agenda. So it was I know so that sad. happens. Uh, but you, what you've told us has been tremendously useful information. And I think everybody will find that this is great information. Tell people how they can find you. So if you have questions about all the stuff we didn't get to cover, you can con they can contact you. How do, how can people uh, find you? Where, where's your website and social media and all that other kind of stuff? Yeah, well, people can find me on my website at the healthy the healthyhiker.com and while you're there sign up for my newsletter and email list. And that is really the primary way that you can um, get all the information from me. I am on Facebook. I have a Facebook group for women. I am on Instagram, but at the healthy hiker without an e h i k r. Um, but my email list is really where I send all the good stuff. So, uh, you know, you, I, 
want to be on my email list, you're going to get useful information. It's not going to be junk. And if you need help with hiking training, if you've got something coming up, that's my area of specialty. If you're struggling with knee pain, reach out and um, let's, let's have a conversation. See how Great. I can help you. And I got to sit on one of your little Zoom uh, presentations a couple of weeks ago. That was great. There was a lot of good information. My wife is, was, li- was sitting next to me listening to it. She goes, that was some really great information on there. I go, yeah, that's pretty good stuff. That's why I have her on the podcast. Knows what she's talking about. <laughs> has great information. So um, yeah, I highly yeah, recommend I, people. I, yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I love sharing. Yeah, I love sharing. And uh, I do give uh, some free webinars now and then. I, I overteach. <laughs> So I'm always putting like telling you everything I know. Um, but I'm glad I'm glad you were there. It was so fun and to have you there and to hear some of your expertise too. So it's always a good time. So it was always it was just fun. I, I just wanted to sit there and go, let's see what one of these is about. And I just uh, I jumped in on it and it was it was a lot of fun. It was great, great information. Uh Alicia, really again, love having you on here. Your information is so great. I wish we had like all day to talk, but I know you've got other stuff you got to do um, than sit here and talk with me all day. Um, but you've got, we, Lisa, we didn't cover everything we wanted to cover, but we covered a lot of stuff. There's going to be a lot of great information here. Um, thank you so much. I urge everybody, if you have a question, to have them contact you directly and and get the right the right stuff. I mean, like you said, you go on a, on a Facebook group and everybody and their uncle is going to have an opinion. Um, 99% of them are probably not going to be great ideas, but, um, but yours are going to be well-founded and obviously you're professional what you do and you've been doing this for a long time and um, uh, really provide a lot of help. So Alicia, once again, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy uh, sitting down and having a chat and we'll have to do it again soon. Absolutely. And if you make your way through Colorado again, like you did last year, by all means, let me know. We'll go do another hike. That was a lot of fun. Fingers crossed. I've got you on my list. (laughs) Awesome. Awesome. Well, everybody, uh, thanks for listening to the Outdoors with Hiking Bob podcast. We'll talk to you next time.